Hello, my name is Lola, and I'm going to be reacting to Old Crash Bandicoot Warped by Cat Icarus. This is the third Crash Bandicoot game. And, uh, well, like the second one, I don't know much about it. And let's see what Caddy thinks about it. And if you want to like, comment, subscribe my channel, you can. Or if you don't want to, that's fine, too. Here we go. Greetings, and salutations, my beautiful people, and welcome to the Cat Show, where I always have to do the ditty ditty of deciding whether or not a game deserves to be slaughtered or salvaged. And let's be honest, right here, right now, Crash Bandicoot 3 is going to get the salvage, so let's just do it right now and save some cherished seconds of our precious treasured lives. Wow, already. But why does it get the salvage? Well, I mean, where do I even begin? I mean, first of all, I am a little bit too nostalgic for this game for my own good. This was the first game I ever played in my life, don't forget. I still remember the day my dad ordered it through the post and I got to open it while he was at work. It made me very happy. I couldn't wish for a better introduction into the world of games when I was still very little. <laughs> and also because it's just fucking awesome, alright? Alright? Okay, dude. Alright? It's fucking awesome, you understand? You're on, Paul! Yes, Crash 3 is not only one of my favourite platformers, but one of my favourite video games ever made, period. So you will be watching a slightly biased video here, word of warning. But if you're anything like me, then revisiting this game will literally make you pregnant with happiness. If you couldn't tell... I fucking love this game! A lot more than... I fucking love... Crash 2, which... I fucking love... A lot more than Crash 1, which... I fucking like a lot. And the release date of this one was yet again one year and one month after the last one, meaning that Naughty Dog had not only found their feet, knew what to change and tweak and what to add with every single Crash game, but they also did it within the same amount of time it takes for me to clear up all of the salty dick tears that I leave around the house after playing these beasts of a game. I'm so sorry, I can't believe I wrote that. So enough with the disgusting stuff, and let's actually talk about why I think this instalment of the meddling marsupials escapades is maybe the best one. And don't worry, like anything, it isn't perfect, so I will be mentioning things I don't like so much. For instance, the entire intro sounds like Clancy Brown is pushing out the biggest chat and it starts off okay at this point a universal interactive studios production but then it starts getting painful here created and developed by naughty dog and then it culminates into a toilet bowl explosion of biblical proportions right here oh you might want to take some senecot there mr brown Arr! and now there's even more of a story here which now makes more sense than the last game with cortex yet again falling out of the damn sky and crashing into an ancient temple releasing aku aku's evil twin brother uka uka which then begs the question if these planks of wood are related who the fuck is the mother and what does she look like is this what happened after that scene in the evil dead anyway it turns out cortex has been taking orders from this pissed off bit of wood ever since the beginning to grab the gems and crystals for him and as he grovels and begs for his forgiveness which is always funny to see after the shit you've been through uka uka forgives cortex since he released him and hires a new evil british face known as entropy to make a time twisting machine to harvest gems and crystals from different time periods by the way does anyone here think that cortex looks a lot like serge tankyan anybody no Okay, then. However, they never actually do it themselves. Is. Instead, Cortex creates new human minions in a secret underground lab in the warp room that you can actually go there yourself and see to enter time periods and retrieve the crystals. And even though they're all a bit fucking useless at that, time is still very much ticking, so Crash and Coco set off together. Hang up, little baby polar bear. I won't get too excited. You aren't in this game. <laughs> As they all try reaching the shiny things before the minions can stop them, while avoiding the indifferent, angry wildlife that play Crash's linear stages. And it's a lot more exciting and varied because of that alone even though the gameplay didn't do that much different at all from Crash 2. And to be honest, it didn't have much to add. It just made bouncing and jumping a lot more free, controlling and adjustable in the air, but everything else was the same. Running, jumping, the speed, weight, spinning, boxes, gems, crystals, Aku Aku, Wumpa Fruit. It just did everything that made Crash 1 and 2 the respected series it was, and did everything that Bubsy 3D didn't do. One thing it did do that I can hugely appreciate, though, was making bouncy Wumpa Fruit crates faster to break at five bounces instead of ten. It may sound like a tiny change, but it's one that makes things a million times better. Instead of this bullshit in Crash 1 and 2, that would take years to get from one end of a bottomless pit to the other in order to break the crates to get the gem. Now it's like this. It's much faster, and getting two Wumpa Fruit per bounce just feels better. What's funny is that Crash 3 does so much similar to Crash 2 that I actually neglected to talk about silly little shit in my Crash 2 video just so I had something to talk about here. Crash could belly flop in 2 and 3, which honestly serves little purpose whatsoever to get reinforced crates and that's it until it's upgraded, and even then its uses are unbelievably situational, yet it is unbelievably fun and satisfying to do regardless, and it's way faster in 3, so it's all good and better than 2. Crash 
Crash 2 also introduced enemies that required sliding into only, which I wanted to cover more of in Crash 3, but for some reason Crash 3 kind of got rid of slide only enemies, which is a huge shame since it means most of the enemies could be attacked and approached the same way without much thought, minus the odd giant enemies that required higher jumps to knock out. In Crash 2 he could also ride that waterboard thing, which was a nice change of pace but nothing flashy, and the jetpack which is the same story, yet in 3 there were a load more vehicles and animals to mess around with in their own respective time periods, and most of them were fantastic fun to play. I say most of them because that's one thing Crash 3 I think new to slightly, the motorcycles in the 1950s. It controls well enough for winning a race, but the speed to turning ratio is massively off, making tight corners an impossibility while keeping at high speed, and some gem runs can be a little aggravating with how stiff it feels sometimes. CTR this certainly isn't. And that pitch black secret stage can actually fuck off. The plane stages in World War times are a lot of fun, and blowing shit up, barrel rolling, and popping the small amount of balloon boxes is always fun. It might be a little bit too slow, though. And in Rings of Power, it may be a little bit too fast. Coco's Jet Ski in Pirate Waters is brilliant and wonderful for your hands if vibration is turned on, and the water physics are just real enough for planning your approaches and cartoony enough for the sake of fast, fun control. Underwater stages were a great change of pace, if you ask me. Nice and open and atmospheric, and the following sub gunning fish thing that you find was awesome with its missiles and ridiculous boost. And it's also great since if you were too reckless with it, you could lose it in one hit point and lose the chance to blow away any seaweed to reveal boxes for the gem. The baby dinosaur in the prehistoric times was also awesome since you had to hatch them first, and then once you're on them, not only could you jump higher and move faster, but also break boxes by touching them and get an extra hit point. And of course, I can't neglect to talk about most people's favorite moment from Crash 3's vast vehicle and riding segments, Coco's Tiger on the Great Wall of China, the substitute to hog riding and bear riding from Crash. And these stages were amazing, a bit slow than those in the games before it, but more densely designed and tricky to navigate. Crystals were obviously the main callback to Crash 2, along with gems for every crate being smashed, and not only is the box counter a fantastic touch, but also hidden coloured gems allowing access to other areas you searched previously returned, with harder routes to get more boxes and gems in other levels. And hey, even the secret routes for not dying in a stage for ultra hard optional content came back. Secrets even came back and were not as good or as clever as Crash 2, I'll admit, and there were only two notable ones in stages that were actually fucking ridiculous, and I reckon they could be done by complete accident by hitting this sign on a cycling stage and getting picked up by a very specific pterodactyl in the yellow gem route of another fucking stage. Okay. And the rest were unlocked by... I'll talk about that later. Oh, and Crash 2 also introduced the world to the Crash Dance whenever he got a gem. And yes, he does it here. It's magnificent. Mm -hmm. What? You want me to do it? Yeah, do it. <laughs> Fuck off, I'm not doing it. So gameplay may have been the definition of not being broken, so not fixing it. Even the ice physics returned on this oily shit, but luckily it's a lot less crazy than Crash 2. But with the added stuff, along with the physics tweaking, it's definitely the definitive Crash experience in my opinion. And one thing I can really commend over Crash 2 is level design. Not only were there even more things packed into every corner with Naughty Dog's signature detail, and not only were there only like two stages with branching paths, thank you. Fuck. And not only were corridor linear levels built more openly to allow you other ways of progression if you had the resources or enough skills to do it, but the designs were also just so damn memorable. Every area, even if being revisited later on, felt unique and totally different in how they were built, with new types of obstacles and enemies, new hazards, and more treacherous paths being introduced in every succeeding type of stage that you came into. And Crash 2 often felt like you were playing the same level yet slightly harder with how it went around its level design for the same areas. But this game makes every level get gradually harder, along with looking and feeling like a totally different level within the same time period, and because of that gives each stage a memorable identity that's been engraved into my head with every single placement of every single object. I've memorized the level designs of this game so much that I love fucking around with them a lot, like here when you stand back and make the frog in the distance follow you into its horrific suicide. Or here when you start running away towards the screen on this bonus platform which triggers the dinosaur to chase you without ever even touching you. I also know the little trick about getting the yellow gem ridiculously early. The visuals are pretty much identical to the second game, yet with the time travelling theme, they throw in way more interesting locations for a platforming game, more splashes of colour and more variety. Even when revisiting some time periods later in the game, you'll find the weather or the time of day completely shifting to give you new moods and a fresh theme on an area you've been to before. Grabbing crystals and gems also felt way more impressive and flashy with the snappier sound design, and the simple flourish of a sparkly explosion made the collectathon elements of this game a lot more standout and satisfying. Tiny details were also amped up, like with being able to find fake Crash hiding away in a Coco stage, who of course was based on a deathly 
new Japanese plushie from the year before, and stuff like being able to bounce on Dingodile after defeating him, or spinning the tomb switches the enemies use to make blocks fall down from the ceiling makes the game feel more alive and one would crash as you control him through it. And along with the added civilization detail, background animations, and tons more things on screen to absorb, not one screen feels void of life or even slightly empty, and you go all over the place here from the distant future to medieval times and even exotic Arabia. The soundtrack is just as fantastic as before, not as great as Crash 2 overall if you ask me, yet still bouncy, infectiously catchy, and a lot more ambitious than before with different genres to match each time period with broader Ooh. instrumental dynamics as well as tunes. Crash also had a lot more animations, along with the death animations which are some of the most cartoony and brilliant you'll ever see on the PS1. <laughs> The death animations are even extreme enough that I managed to die here, but then grab the gen during my death animation descent and then exit the level totally unscathed. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Oh, and how about this for new gameplay jacked up to 11? In a very Mega Man approach, Crash could now beat bosses and get properly rewarded for it with new power-ups. I've already mentioned the super belly flop you start with, but that doesn't come close to the usefulness of the double jump, death tornado spin, fruit bazooka, which was the coolest fucking thing ever when I was younger, yet doesn't have as much use nowadays for me, apart from getting a few boxes and speedy time and a few enemies. And the way the power-ups all work within each other to make the gameplay flow faster or more efficiently after you get better at them not only makes revisiting areas feel fresh and then let you access areas as you couldn't before, but also the game taught you through bonus challenges and showed you that they could be used together, most famously with the double jump death tornado spin glide registered trademark. One of the coolest things I've ever seen implemented into a platformer, and much like the slide jump in Crash 2, could be used to bypass tricky segments, save your ass in more than one occasion like in Tomb Raider with its rising water, and if you got really good with it, shortcut levels in half for extra time bonuses in the newly added time trials. The fifth power up, more for the time trials, was the Crash Dash, a move that makes Crash run like he's been done for cocaine smuggling. And that also allows you to replay the stages with a totally different approach when you grab the clock at the beginning of it. Get to the end of the stage as fast as possible and break particular boxes to stop the clock. If you die, it reloads you to the beginning of the stage unbelievably quickly and you never lose any lives. And luckily, the memorable level design makes this actually insanely fun. And combining every power up together makes it even more satisfying as you skip huge chunks of levels. It's just sad how getting them only really unlocks the secret warp room for new stages and new routes in old stages to get more gems. Not really secret if you ask me and a little bit disappointing, but damn, it's a great challenge. <laughs> and there were even three tiers of relics to win for them. Sapphire, which are pretty damn easy, honestly. Gold, which aren't too bad either. But the platinum relics are the big daddies and the ones you do not fuck around with. If you want to truly test your knowledge of Crash 3, you go for these fuckers, in which you need to know every shortcut, every time crate, and the fastest way to break them, every Aku Aku crate, Jesus. and where to sacrifice them for the sake of time. And even then, you can only just make it by fucking milliseconds, not even joking. If these were essential, I'd say this was far too fucking difficult for anybody, and I wouldn't like playing this game as much as I do let alone for kids, but luckily it is completely optional. Just sapphires will do to complete the game. Yeah. But you don't really want them. Look, they ugly. <laughs> Go for the platinums and cry like a little bitch. Oh, and the bosses? My god, the bosses. How much greater could they be? Okay, they aren't the most amazing platforming bosses of all time, but they're a million times more action-packed, kinetic, aggressive, and memorable than anything Crash 1 and 2 had for sure. I even loved how after beating all the levels, all that would be left standing between you and the next five warp pads is one button. A daunting, singular, egotistical button that removed every other level of that world until you beat it. It's small things like that and the fact that bosses would directly talk to you frequently that built them up properly and made you feel threatened before even entering their area. And it's just cooler to see what unique personalities you'd be fighting and get a better idea of how to hate them before kicking their asses. Tiny Tiger <laughs> is a great first boss, easy yet fast paced with a splicing of lines everywhere to catch you off guard. Dingadile is also great with an actual unpredictable moveset and the unique mechanic of needing to get him to shoot you to reach him and then leaving enough space to escape before he blows up is pretty damn cool. Entropy is pretty good and requires a lot of concentration to his attack so you can decide what to do at the last split second. But Engine is the best crash boss ever made and it's fucking insane with two phases, rockets everywhere, machine guns, different high damage attacks, fast and sporadic movements, weak spots showing and hiding constantly and holy shit it's so badass. And Cortex was uh, okay for a final boss. The best Cortex boss by a mile and it also requires decent footing with the stage and focusing on Cortex and the masks battling it out. And also knocking Cortex into a hole multiple times is so good of a feeling. But it pales in comparison to Engine before him and this is a little bit too easy for all things said. Speaking of that, you weren't only constantly abused by the bosses, but Aku Aku would also sometimes appear to egg you on and encourage your great work you're doing. The level of character and charm in this relatively short game with a protagonist with no voice is staggering. Even Crash has decided to step back from potentially fucking other animals and leaves that to Coco, <laughs> who 
who just kind of stands there all impatient like she's waiting for a contemporary wine at the Christmas party. And this is going to sound really weird, but the version of the game that I played and have on the disc is obviously the PAL version, yet what you're seeing on the screen is the North American release, purely because it plays at a way higher frame rate. And what's even stranger is that the PAL version of the game had a lot of alterations to make the game harder, regional difficulty as it were. In the PAL version, these wizards had two hit points and you could see them in their pants after the first hit. TNT boxes explode a lot faster, some enemies like the scorpions move ridiculously faster, the sword swingers pull and spin their swords in half the time, lasers have shorter cooldown periods in the future, and more missiles are fired at you, and for the returning death route, if you died on the death route in the PAL version, the thing would vanish for that level, whereas if you reach the route in the US release, it stays locked in place. I don't understand things. Oh, and how about the hidden ending? A lot better than any other game before it, and one that actually makes me want to finish the game entirely. As you see, Cortex and Tropy at the end oh, of the game yeah. reverted back into They're babies bitters. as they fight over a distraught Uka Uka. Cute, funny, and a much more finalizing blow and humiliation to Cortex that only the epic gameplay and challenge to get every gem and relic could match up for, for the PS1. But you know, overall, how exactly do I sum up this game? Ah, bollocks to that, this game rocks my cock off, so how about I instead sum up Crash? Well, firstly, huge thanks to all of you at home for being so accepting and understanding towards me deciding to revisit this series, because as you can see, there was a lot of shit I completely abandoned in the supposedly deeper and more analytic retrospectives I did all those years ago. Secondly, going back on point, well, even though not revolutionary to any degree, it's clear to see why Crash became so beloved even from the dated, awkward moments in the first game. All down to the visual design, soundtrack, high production value, simple to grasp yet damn near impossible to master gameplay, really memorable level designs and a firmly established charm, character and identity. And with each succeeding game it all just kept improving one year after the next, which isn't something that happens too often. Crash became the PlayStation mascot for years, helped shift heaps of consoles back in the day and it's awesome that he's coming back to PS4 with his own remastered trilogy like he rightfully deserves. If you haven't already, check out the original trilogy and even Crash Team Racing for one of the best kart races I've ever played and I especially recommend them all on the PS Store at individual cheaper prices than the first Super Mario Brothers game. A Classic, absolutely, but still, in my opinion, you get a lot more for your money with the digital crash games. It's all a little bit warped, if you ask me. <laughs> Also, Crash 3 makes me splooge. And so, because of all of that, Crash Bandicoot 3 oh, warped gets the sound. I've already You're... done that, haven't yeah. I? Well, shit. Do the crash dance. Fuck. Come on. How am I going to end this video, then? Do the dance. Come on, Caddy. Come on. Come you really on. want me to do it, don't you? Okay, fine. Fine, <laughs> fine. I'm doing it. This video has been brought in part to you by chrono.gg forward slash caddy, an awesome website in which an awesome game is sold every 24 hours at the most ridiculously reduced price you can imagine. I won't say what's on the website right this second, but if you go to the description to chrono.gg forward slash caddy, you'll be able to go and see it yourself. And everything you see on the screen, these have all been in the past, so be excited for every 24 hours and just keep that link bookmarked so you can see every single day a new game at a new offer. Thank you so much for listening, everybody, and I'll see you soon. Greetings and salutations, my beautiful people. What? Is the mic on? Oh, fucking hell. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. And let's be honest right here, right now, Crash Bandicoot 3 is getting the salvage, so let's just get it over with. Right. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, crash, uh, was it crash four at a time? Yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah, that's it. That's my reaction to old Crash Bandicoot Warped by Cat Icarus. The game does look really good. And yeah, that's it. Everyone take care of yourselves and each other, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.